500 on average per month. Ooh. But yeah, this close. is but this number can fluctuate quite a lot and it's going to be different for everybody. What's going on guys? My name is Psyche and welcome back to another episode of Richie's podcast. Now I know it's been like what, 2 months since our last episode, but school gets in the way, what can you do? Anyways, from today and onwards, I'm going to put out timestamps for each topic that we will be covering in each episode. So if you're only interested in a specific section, feel free to navigate to that part of the podcast. Also, some people also suggested this, but I'm going to put some gameplay footage of Dead Cells in the background, just so things don't get too boring. In any case, let's get to the good stuff. So today, I've brought here yet another guest. This is Charlie, whom I actually met in person while on campus, and he is a filmmaker. So why don't you introduce yourself, Charlie? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Charlie. I've been filmmaking, or like, I started filmmaking slash photography um, two, two or three years ago now. Um, and yeah, I've been enjoying it every step of the way. And now I've come to Vancouver as well and going to try and continue it here as well. Yeah, um, I guess like a question I can start off is, what initially got you interested in film? Um, so when I was super young, I think I was like 12 or 13 years old, um, I created a YouTube channel with my younger brother. Um, it was called Team Techers and it was, it was about playing football or, or soccer. Um, and then after a couple years of doing that, I realized like the, the channel didn't really go anywhere, but I realized I liked the editing part um, a lot. So I figured I might as well try actually filmmaking about something that is not football. Um, and then from there, I st started to make travel films and was inspired by like Sam Calder and, and YouTubers like that. And that kind of got me going in, into the whole um, filmmaking industry. Mm, yeah, you know, funny story. I don't know if I... I think I told you this in person, but how I got into editing, because I'm also interested in that aspect of filmmaking in a way, even though we make very different con uh, content. So in high school, I just, using Photoshop, I wanted to make memes. That's kind of how I got into it. And that eventually bled into other softwares such as Premiere Pro. And then recently, I've also tried to get into After Effects, but a lot of it is really daunting. Yeah, I agree. After Effects is like a whole, a whole nother level. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just just starting out on that as well. <laughs> yeah. So I guess this kind of connects into the next topic that I had. So what was like the biggest barrier for you to get into the film? Was it like about w learning different equipment or learning about all the editing softwares? Um, I think at the start, it was understanding that you don't need a lot of equipment to to make a good film or you don't need to go somewhere like extravagant to make a good film so mm. like i said i was always getting inspiration from people like sam colder so i would only be making travel films when i went on holiday which was like twice twice a year or something like that um and i would end up making a highland video and uh i don't know my my family's from europe so a, a, a mm. video about switzerland as well and I'd oh, make two, okay. two videos a year, which means there's not a lot of practice there. So there's not a lot of improvement as well. Um, so yeah, I feel like the, the major barrier was just understanding that you can make, make a film anywhere you are. Like if you're at home stuck in quarantine or something, just, just uh, pick up a camera or, or your iPhone and put something together. And like that's better practice than waiting for a whole year to go on a trip just for that one specific moment. Mm, exactly. That's actually kind of how I started my channel. So um, the first couple of years when I started college, well, we go to the same college, but still, um, I was like really, really introverted. And it wasn't until third year where I learned, you know, maybe I should actually do something. Um, I plan on going into a social work profession in the future. And social work and editing is just extremely unrelated. So it's kind of a weird set of skills to have. But I think it was December of last year where I finally decided to do something. And that's when I started to look into these softwares. I started looking into how YouTube works. And I think the biggest barrier for me is to learn these softwares like Premiere Pro or um, Photoshop because 
Now, editing, I don't think takes a lot of learning to do. I don't know if it was the same for you. And a lot of it just takes time. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Um, just like time and like doing things over and over and over again until you kind of get the hang of it. Um, yeah, I was, I was quite lucky for, for me for Premiere because um, I started on, on Final Cut and then I had to switch to Premiere when I got um, my first job. And mm. they said, they, they basically said, if you're going to work here, you have to switch to Premiere. And at the job, I was editing videos every day. So that was actually really good practice. And I pretty yeah. much got Premiere up and running within like a, a week. So yeah, it was, it was, it was all good. <laughs> yeah, that does sound pretty good. Because um, over the last couple of years, I did do a bunch of personal projects. But I never bothered uploading these, so nobody ever saw them. Um, it was really until... I created my channel when I started to experiment like different types of content, different types of thumbnails. So I'm sure yeah, I feel like, oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I kind of interrupted you. I feel like uploading just gives you more feedback because other people see the stuff and you realize what's working well and what's not working well. So I feel like when you upload stuff, you kind of gain a better appreciation for your own work, but also figure out what you can improve on a little quicker than if you're just showing it to yourself. Yeah, exactly. And the thing about uploading stuff onto the internet is that um, people on there aren't going to sugarcoat anything. If they think something that you did was bad, then they'll just say that it's bad. It's not like friends where they'll try to encourage you. Um, they'll try to say nice things. But I think a part of what makes uploading on YouTube nice is having that unfiltered feedback. I don't know if you've seen that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, most of the comments I've gotten have been have been positive comments, um, mm. but there there is that occasional time when when someone says something that is is I guess negative or or constructive, and you look at it and you're like, ah, yeah, I, I see where you're coming from, and um, I'll improve that for the next time around. So that's yeah, I, it also helps because a lot of the times there's no face to the picture or no 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 face to the name, so people feel like they're able to say whatever comes to their mind because there's less repercussions that way. And I guess that can be good and bad, but in, in the sense of getting feedback, um, I think that's definitely a good thing. Yes, exactly. And, you know, the, once your channel gets big enough, um, I heard this from a lot of sources, but you are going to get some people that are just very obnoxious. And part of growing as a creator is to learn how to deal with it. Yeah, definitely. I've, I've seen a lot of screenshots and like, I mean, just comment sections where bigger YouTubers that th that I watch just get like completely roasted in the comments. And I kind of feel bad for them. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I guess it comes with the comes with the job. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I've actually seen a couple of your films and they're really high quality. Um, I believe <laughs> I've said you. this before, but honestly, if I didn't see like your view count, I would have believed that your content came from like a million subscriber con uh, channel. <laughs> Thank you so much. Like it's very impressive. Thank so, you. And something I was wondering is, so you've made short films, you made some tutorials. Um, is that like the types of projects that you're most interested in? Or are you more open to experimentations with other types of things? I definitely want to stay within the realm of filmmaking or photography. Um, occasionally, I would be very happy to do a vlog and make some sort of travel video, which is going back to why I actually started filmmaking um, in the first place. So yeah, I would, I'd be very happy to do that just because it's always like when, when you look at other um, bigger YouTubers in the same genre, um, mm -hmm. they end up also making travel videos as well um and with with those kind of videos you can also incorporate photography and videography as aspects in there as well um so yeah I've, i'd be open to experimenting with with uh new types of films but i would always try to draw it back to the genre of film and photography mm. and i think it's a really good interest to have especially how um in the future i'm assuming there's going to be a lot of gigs that are available for these types of things because film advertisement um or just filmmaking in general is going to be in high demand yeah definitely i was i mean in in um just just thinking about last year i took a gap year off of college 
and decided to spend a couple months trying out just being full time uh, a full time freelancer. Um, and I partnered up with a friend back home in Hong Kong, and we actually ended mm. up getting uh, way way more gigs than we thought we would just by word of mouth promotion and based off other projects that we've created. So like pe- people in the community talk and then they reach out to you. So yeah, just having that as an option in the future is definitely super exciting for me. Yeah, I've definitely actually wanted to try that. It's just that I kind of started my channel in a bad time since um, I believe last year in December, I was still in third year. I, I didn't take a gap year, unlike you. Um, I kind of just started because everything was still in um, online. So we just had online classes. So that kind of gave me a lot more time to work with. But now starting in this, uh, September, since we have to go back to campus, it's gone a lot more busy. Yeah, did, did you find it a lot easier to, to keep up with the schedule while you're doing online classes and staying home rather than co- commuting to campus and stuff? Oh, yeah, definitely. So now um, I try to get out a video every single week. But even then, that is extremely uh, tiring because I still have to record the footage. And if it's like a special type of video, like a tutorial or like a rant, I have to do a script. And then that's not really including recording the commentary, making the thumbnail, and then thinking about how to market the video. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of steps that go into every video. And after a while, I don't, I don't know how it is for you, but it does get a little repetitive at times, almost mm-hmm. tedious, like the process of setting everything up, like recording the audios and then editing the video. It's It gets a little tedious sometimes. Um, but yeah, I don't know how that is for you. Do, do you find that as well? Uh, Yeah, so I actually find myself wanting to do a lot more types of experiment, uh, experimentational, um, or just, yeah, just experimental videos. But the thing is, since because of time constraints, I find that it's really hard to do that. So was there ever like a time when you were just absolutely stuck and you didn't know how to proceed with a certain project, like setting up a shot or you don't know how to edit an effect, that type of thing? Um, yeah, so at the start of this year, I tried to, well, like I, I said, I would try to put out one video every week and I actually managed mm-hmm. it for about five or six months. But on the third, no, on, on the second week, so the second video that I was doing, um, I filmed everything. It was, it was a tutorial on, or it was supposed to be a tutorial on how to take drink, drink photography. And I was like, uh, mm. the, the, the video was going to be called five ways to take a photo of a certain drink. I think it was, I think it was like a gin and tonic or something. Um, mm. And at the end of it, after I had taken all these five photos, I was looking through it, and it was it was about like two days before I had to upload or before I said I would upload. Um, and the photos just looked completely terrible. Um, oh. <laughs> so I was like, "All right, we're gonna we're gonna restart. We're gonna change the entire video concept to taking one photo." instead of five and I can focus on making the one photo look look good as opposed to having five terrible looking photos um so basically uh yeah I just I think I had the weekend so the the two days left were were luckily the weekend so I pretty much spent Saturday and Sunday planning the video buying the stuff that I needed for it and then filming it and editing it um and yeah I guess it was just like staying up a little later and waking up a little earlier to get everything finished how Uh, how about you have you ever Have you ever been stuck with a video or anything like that? Uh, there are a lot of things I want to try out, um, especially with After Effects. There's like motion tracking. There's like mm-hmm. 3D effects I want to try. But the thing is, though, a lot of it just takes time. And like so many people outside, well, I guess so many people that don't really know editing, they kind of underestimate just how much time it takes to do these edits. Like, I'm sure it's the same for you. Like when you're actually going out into the real world and you're trying to find stuff to film, um, just setting up like the different angles and stuff. I'm assuming that takes Mm -hmm. a lot of time. Yeah, especially when I don't know. I think the best example is Casey Neistat. If if you've ever watched any of his videos, it looks super simple. um, But he would have like a lot of his shots are of, of him when the camera's on a tripod. So if you think about how he comes up with that shot, she would have to place the tripod down and then 
walk back to, to what he was doing, walk past the camera, and then go back and pick up the camera. Um, so, I mean, one, I don't know, three second shot would probably take him about five minutes to record. And that just mm -hmm. adds up when you have like 10, 15, 20 shots. Um, but another thing about the editing that takes uh, what you said about the editing taking a lot of time, but a lot of people not really knowing that. Um, my like, I hate I hate it when um, if if you're working with clients or something, you finish off your video, and then they're, and then they're like, "Oh, do you mind just slapping on some subtitles over top of this?" Oh. And I'm like, <laughs> "Sure, but this is gonna take a lot. <laughs> like, it's gonna take longer than you think." I don't know. So I, I I find subtitles to be very tedious and annoying to put on. <laughs> I don't know about oh, you. Oh yeah, they are. Um, I never yeah. worked with clients before, so I don't know what it's like. But I've seen a couple of tutorials on uh, subtitles. And it's not hard to do. It just it takes a long time. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like it should be something that could be automated, especially if it's just like English word, like English subtitles underneath an English speaking video. I don't know. I feel like yeah. Premiere could have like an auto system to do that. Maybe in the future, yeah. but we'll see. Yeah, maybe in the future. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I've actually had a lot of um, these really crazy edited videos. And by the time you're done, you're really proud of it. Um, so I guess, what's like the one project that you were the most proud of ever since you started filmmaking? Um, in terms of coming up with a crazy edit, I would say um, probably the Dalgona coffee video um, on, my, on my YouTube channel. Um, I mm. tried to do an effect where the instant coffee would be spinning around in the air and it came oh. off pretty, pretty well. So I was, I was super happy about how that turned out. And, and since that was the first shot of the video of a I don't know, 15 second video, um, it just, yeah, it just attracted a lot of people because like you have this floating coffee thing and you're like, oh, <laughs> how do you do that? Um, yeah, I was, yeah, that was probably the, the one that I was most proud of in terms of trying something quite ambitious and, and managing to pull it off. Yeah, that does sound pretty impressive. <laughs> How about you? Do you have any, um, do you have a favorite video? Oh, favorite video? Um, I did this one tutorial on Dead Cells. Uh, I don't know if you'll understand anything that I'll say, but um, basically there are these different levels that you can go to called biomes. And a run kind of, it's dictated by which which biomes you go to and that kind of affects how your run ends up so i did a tutorial on how to do that and it's on my channel um that was from a time when i wasn't too comfortable speaking just yet so i kind of there was a lot of repetition of what i said but in mm -hmm. the end that video was about 30 minutes and i would say um everything took around a week to do and this includes like planning um scripts video recording, getting all that footage organized. So I, I was really proud of that because on YouTube at the time, there was no guide on biomes for Dead Cells. So that was kind of my take on it. And I was really glad how it, how it um, turned out. Yeah, definitely finding something that's not on YouTube yet and making a quality video about that is, is a great idea because then people are going to find value in, in what you're putting out. Yeah, so this kind of goes into our next topic, which is going to be primarily about my channel um i think if you were to start a con uh, a channel today i would say you would have to niche down on a specific topic until you can't niche down anymore because it's so important to create content that you know people are looking for but does not exist yet yeah that makes sense and i think that's sort of a problem i'm running into because i'm not that niche like there's a lot of other people doing exactly what I'm doing. Um, but I also feel like I can't niche down any further or I don't want to just because I feel like it will not have as big of an audience, but I could, I could be wrong in that, in that as well. Mm, well, I think, well, I don't know what it's like running like a film channel. Maybe it's different. Um, yeah, it, I definitely think it's a little bit more difficult to do that, but I don't know. <laughs> um so 
Yeah, the topic for this podcast, for this episode, is going to be how much money does a 14K subscriber channel make in a month? So do you want to take a guess, Charlie? Just like um, a rough estimate. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess around 600 Canadian dollars. You are pretty close. Um, so I make... 500 on average per month Ooh, but yeah, this close. is but this number can fluctuate quite a lot and it's going to be different for everybody um so how monetization works on youtube is that your profit is based on this system called cpm which stands for cost per mill mill meaning thousand in french i don't know why it's like that it basically calculates on average how much money you make per 1000 views Um, so for me, it's slightly above average. Um, I know some people make as little as like 50 cents per 1000 views, but some people can make like up to $10, which is really, really big. Like on average, it's around $4. So that's kind of why anyway. there's, do you know why there's such a big fluctuation between that? Uh, well, uh, it depends on a lot of factors. Um, is your type of content in demand? What is your audience like? Um, what kind of content are you creating? Because if you make like a different type of videos, then obviously it's going to be a little bit different. Oh, right. Yeah, that makes sense. So what you said yours is around like four dollars, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Per... Yeah. So is, is that because the, the gaming sector is around that? Um, like most most other gaming channels will have a similar um, similar amount to you as well. Um, I'm not too sure about that, actually. I just know that the the measure is more on average. So on average on YouTube, the CPM is $4. Um, I don't know how it is in gaming because I know gaming can be extremely saturated. There's just so much content on it for YouTube that it's really hard for you to stand out. Mm, right, yeah. So wait, how how do you stand out then? Oh, okay. This is kind of a long story, but... For me, when I started my channel, um, the reason for me starting it is because I wanted to see a specific type of content. And this is for Dead Cells, the game that I play. I wondered why there wasn't like a tier list for weapons on the current version of the game. Back then it was 2.1. Nobody on YouTube made a video about it. So I was just there like, wouldn't it be really cool if I made this specific content since you know, I'm the one that wants to see it. So maybe other people will want to see it too. So that's kind of how I got to the place that I am today. But if I'm going to be honest, I never actually intended for my channel to reach the point of where it is today. I thought I was just going to get like a couple hundred views per video and that was it. Yeah, I guess when you make great content, you're going you're gonna to get a huge audience like, like what you have right now. Yeah, and I definitely think the first 1,000 subscribers is the hardest process of every single channel. Because the thing is, um, when you get big enough, YouTube will kind of put you in a group, put you in like a specific category. They will say like, oh, so Charlie makes this type of content. So we're going to market. We're going to recommend his videos to this type of people. So that's kind of how it, um, YouTube helps you out. But at the same time, though, YouTube is under no obligations to uh, recommend your content. So it's kind of like a win-win situation for creators and YouTube. Yeah, true. And did, did you mention that that would start happening? Or like you, yeah, you found that it started happening for you after you reached a thousand? Or like is, is, is that when YouTube kind of says, all right, we're going to promote this, this person's content a little more is, is when they reach a thousand? I am not sure. Um, so the point where I saw my channel started to pick up was after I uploaded my tier list. Because for some reason, people really like tier lists. So that was when the part where I looked on my analytics and then YouTube started to put out impressions. That's basically recommendations. So back then, um, I was gaining like a steady amount. And then I was like, okay, so this is my chance. This is my chance to actually make it. So I started to pump out videos really fast and that's kind of how 
Well, I don't know if this was the cause of it, but I would like to believe that is how I actually managed to reach around 1,000 subscribers. Yeah, I think it sounds like it probably is because I heard um, YouTube will also recommend your videos the more the more frequently you upload. So I guess if you picked it up, that's probably a big factor in 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 your growth as well. Probably yes, uh, but you know it's the YouTube algorithm. Nobody really knows how it works exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> yeah, so I guess a final type of a final topic we can talk about is. Uh, what's next for you, Charlie? Is there like a video or a project that you're working on right now? Um, the like in terms of a new video that's coming out that I'm super excited for. Um, there was a project that I worked on with a DJ, uh, back in Hong Kong, and we filmed um a one hour long set of of just him performing, um, in this super cool kind of like an arena with like super nice columns going throughout the the entire location and the lighting was pretty good too um so yeah that's that's going to come out hopefully in two weeks um on on my channel he's he's already posted the full one hour live stream on his but i'm going to go over how we shot that and how how we lit that um so yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to get that out as well yeah that does sound really impressive actually <laughs> How about you? Any big projects coming up? Um, I do actually plan to upload a lot in December. Um, I believe I'm going to mention this in the video I'm going to upload tomorrow. Well, technically, sorry, not tomorrow. The the video I'm going to upload right after this episode comes out because I've already up I've already completed editing that video. But usually, I make a couple videos ahead in advance since you never know how busy my schedule is. You know, yeah, maybe I won't yeah. have time for that. That. That makes sense. I think that's something I should probably start doing because I'm finding out that university is a little busier than I thought it would be. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so do you have any uh, plugs that you like to do? Maybe t if you have like an Instagram or a channel or if you want to give a shout out to anybody? Uh, sure. Um, my my YouTube channel uh, is Charlie Stewart. Um, also, yeah, and, and my Instagram is charlie stewart dot films um and yeah <laughs> yeah uh, i'll make sure to put that in the description so do you have any questions left for me charlie um i actually was wondering uh what is your favorite part about editing because i get this question a lot because i, I tell people that i really like editing but and they always ask me what mm. my favorite part is so i was wondering what your favorite part about editing is my favorite part is definitely finding a way to differentiate every video that I make because I think some people do this on YouTube but when it comes to like gaming they just kind of create the same formula the same kind of um, structure and they just upload that daily but for me when I'm showcasing like an item in the game I like to find some unique way to present it so maybe it's like a really flashy intro maybe it's like um Maybe it's just me taking really strategic plays during the run. So that's kind of how I incorporate creativity into my edits. And that's definitely the funnest part about making each video. Is, is like how you can make it different and like be creative with it. Yeah, exactly. Because I yeah, think yeah. ultimately editing, it's like a way of, it's like a form of artistic expression. At least that's how I see it. Yeah, I can completely agree. Yeah. So, did you have any other questions? Um, I mean, I have I have a bunch of questions to ask you if if you've got the time. <laughs> uh, we can probably um, do one more if that's one okay. more question. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, do you have any YouTubers that you look up to? Uh, yes, actually. Um, so one of the main motivations for me to create a channel was this one other Dead Cells creator. So his name is. Azumaro Ferry, um, he made content on Dead Cells over the course of 2020. This is when we were in quarantine. So back then, when he started out with nothing, he essentially knew nothing about editing, how to make content for YouTube. And then over the course of the year, because we were both interested in this game that we both played, I was able to see his growth just from like nothing 
to a couple of thousand subscribers, which was huge. He still makes content for it even now. And a big part of inspiring people is to see this progress. It's to see someone um, become better. And I think that is what pushed me to create my channel because I ultimately believe that I can become better. I try to like improve every single video. Maybe it's the way I commentate. Maybe it's how I edit things. So that's kind of the experience for me. Yeah, I think that's definitely the best way to go about go about creating and just like trying to constantly improve. Definitely super inspiring for everyone watching. Oh yeah, and for YouTube, you know, it's free. So you literally have nothing to lose. Yeah, when exactly. you're starting out from zero, you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Yeah, definitely a great way to think about it. Okay, so I guess we can wrap it up for today. We've been going on for around 30 minutes now. All right, yeah, thanks. so... Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. You've been a really, really good guest. Thank you. So this definitely has enjoyed been... that podcast. <laughs> oh yeah, me too. So yeah, this has been Richie's podcast, episode 5. Thank you all for tuning in, and we'll see you all next time.